Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews of items, and convention panels, and other exciting things that we run into from time to time. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. This is finding voice, uh, developing voice in your writing, or something along those lines. Do we want to start with intros? Sure. Sure. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. My name is S.A. Bradley. I am a author of the book, Speaking for Pleasure, How R Makes You Happy and Healthy. Yes, yes, it does. I'm also uh, the uh, creator of a podcast been going on for about four years called Hellbent Horror. Both, all of my ideas are basically on the concept that uh, I do a deep dive into horror as social commentary and basically the idea that it's a handshake with your shadow self and it can actually help you get over some crazy things that have happened in your life. And I like talking about the social changes that happen around. If you really want to know what happened in any decade, what people are really afraid of, look at the horror movies of the time. That's what they're there for. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is C. Uh, my name is C. David Um uh, I'm a Nigerian science person. Uh, I wrote the novel, David Bogle, Gone Master. Um, urban fantasy set in West Nigeria. Um, I write contemporary fantasy, uh, epic fantasy, the horror, kind of across the spectrum. Uh, and I teach at the University of Arizona, Creative Writing, uh, to undergrads. Um, and I'm also part of the MFA program at the university. Yeah. My first time at this talk. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is not actually Spanky McSpankface. Um, however, I was inebriated when I registered for this. Uh, <laughs> okay. And everybody thought it would be fun to just call me Spanky McSpankface. So I am Spanky McSpankface. Um, I am an author, uh, screenwriter, poet. Uh, playwright, uh, I don't say anything, I'm an adventurer, uh, and uh, I write across genres with many different voices, so this is a rather apt panel for me to be on, and aside from that, um, you should all buy my books, and get an editor. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is KJ Kabza. I write uh, short stories, fantasy, and science fiction. My first print book came out last year, which is displayed beautifully here, The Ramset Algorithm and Other Stories, for sale in the usual places online, and also I have a couple copies on me if you just can't wait. Um, I am on this panel because I have published over 80 stories in something like 50 different venues, and since I write short fiction, I've written stories in a lot of different voices, so this topic is of interest to me. Uh, hi, I'm Jessica Feinberg. I'm a local author, illustrator, and small business owner. Uh, I write in a number of different genres, I guess you'd say. Uh, if you've been trying to figure out what you would call the genre for my main series, I guess it's sort of urban fantasy, but written as field guides. So if you've read Donatopia, it's like that, but our world. No, it's an island somewhere. Uh, I've written 16 books in that series, and then I've also written children's picture books. I have my first short story book coming out. And I've also been writing how-to books, which that was an entirely different voice to have to find because I didn't want them to be boring. So that was a challenge as well. So I guess we have like pretty much every type of, I don't think we have an actual historian here, right? We're missing, we're missing historians. Not true. <laughs> Full historian. Well, you're sort of historian, you're sort of a historian, right? Okay, well, we have it all covered. Trump. 
Okay. Um, how do you uh, how do you uh, determine voice uh, mm. for what you're writing? Well, that's a really interesting question because I'm listening to what everybody has to say. It's almost like a, a game of telephone on what voice is for what everybody's saying. So some of us are talking about character voice, coming up with a story style that is a different voice, and then there's the other side of it, which is the voice of the author, the uh, way that you find a what your interests are and what your passions are, what your obsessions are. So everything always starts for me on what excites me to be able to write. I'm going to spend a lot of hard time with these characters, as Kelly mentioned, sometimes just doing historical backgrounds on it. Uh, I do basically radio drama, <laughs> except it's just modernized into podcasts. So I write hundreds of thousands of words to be able to do uh, almost 100 shows over that time period. And each one has a separate voice, but there's the one kernel that gets it all to make sense, which is my voice, which is you know, kind of a mixture of people that I've loved over the years that I've stolen from, uh, that suddenly feels that it has some confidence. I, I think for me to be able to write good characters, again, kind of short stories, uh, I have to be uh, invested in the story in a way that is so that voice is where I come from when I'm talking about this kind of thing. Uh, talking about where I get people, uh, characters, uh, that's usually from my life in some form or from people that I've stolen from at bars. You know, listening to people talk about their, their sorry lives, it's sometimes where I get some of the ideas. But the, the, the curious thing for me is uh, coming up with a voice that is mine, that is unique, that is why I'm compelled to write or what makes it my stuff. And uh, when I can talk to that, it's, it's kind of uh, almost campfire tale with a little bit of uh, intellectual uh, dazzle, I guess, could be in there. I don't want you to say uh, that I'm dumb, so I come in a little bit hot and fast on that. Uh, but the idea of, there's a guy back in the late 70s, early 80s, who's been on the radio all the time, Paul Harvey, who did the rest of the story. And that was a storyteller to me. And so what I do is basically Paul Harvey over and over again in my own ways, plus a mixture of my uncle who told great stories and all the lies I told in elementary school, all that stuff all combined, basically gives me the voice that I can then have the confidence, okay, I've got that going for me, now I can start working on other characters, now I can start working on what my themes might be. Themes kind of make themselves that way, so I'm glad it was I don't think there's a, I don't think there's such a thing on we get a chess clock. <laughs> <laughs> chess. Yes. So your point, um, your point about like working to hone your own individual voice very carefully, being like very conscious of what, where you pull it from, made me think about how um, you mentioned earlier in your remarks that there's three different sort of different kinds of voices that you're talking about: author versus character versus story. Um, and I think. It, uh, it's useful to point out that if you write in the first person rather than the third person, you're, you're making things another layer more difficult yes. for yourself. Because when, when we talk about the voice of the story or the voice of an author, we don't have to be quite so deeply inside our character's head to try to figure out how are they going to talk. So um, if there are people who are having difficulty figuring out what is my voice, what is the voice of my story, maybe it would help you to try to write a story first in the third person or something like that. Um, rather than overcomplicating everything with all the layers at once. Which is not to say don't do it, it's too hard, just be aware um, that there's more at play there and more to consider. And I think if you're not sure what your voice is, one of the most important things you can do is look at who you love, not just in writing, but also in filmmaking. I noticed that all of my favorite movies, almost all of them, have narration, but the narration doesn't match what's happening on the screen. <laughs> almost always. Uh, it's usually a little comical or sarcastic, and that definitely had an impact um, on my writing and the odd thing is that there's a voice that I use in my books that the readers never see which is when I'm working on them I often read them in a really weird professor voice because <laughs> they're, sci they're scientific field guides they're like you guys never hear that character who's back there doing some of the writing but that helped me a lot when I was trying to figure out my own way to, to write guides was to just literally say it out loud as a character reading the story. Also, also on the point of looking for what you love, 
if you're worried that you're going to be too transparent when you rip off somebody else's voice, I don't think you will be because no matter how hard you try to nail somebody else's voice, you can't, you can't help putting kind of your, your own spin on things. Um, there's, there's this one author, I think his, his name is Yves Menard. I don't know if anybody's heard of him. But uh, something that he said once at a previous convention really stuck with me. Style is what you can't help yourself from doing. Yes. Um, and I think voice is the same way. So if you're like, I want to write a novel like Dean Koontz or whomever, it's, it's not going to be Dean Koontz. And nobody's going to accuse you of ripping off that voice. It's something you can try on, see how it comes out, and then But you know, if it doesn't come naturally to you, obviously don't try too hard to be your favorite writer because you're never going to be them. You should try to be like the best version of your own voice. I've got a really, really annoying story. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm ready. entirely on this subject, and it's all my wife's fault. Um, anyways, um, I started writing From a Broken Land. It was going to be a, uh, an explanation of uh, poli sci in a fantasy, in a, in a fantasy uh, set, and it, it continues through. And I started writing it, and of course, my voice, my style, was going to be standard fantasy, right? I'm be very prosaic, I'm going to play narration, do a lot of wordplay, have fun with that. And I had taken a couple of weeks off to get the, I'd already plotted everything out, you know, just a matter of just pounding out words, right? And uh, I take a couple of weeks off. Now my wife, of course, has absolutely nothing to do during this time. Okay, I mean, she doesn't have to go out and work, she doesn't have to do anything, so sit around the house and maybe make me a sandwich every eight hours just to keep me writing. Right, so she st uh, so I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing, and the main characters of um, Gidden and uh, Rinkins come out exactly like that. They come out as kind of a military, kind of prosaic, alliterative text. And then she decides to start watching Jane Austen, a Jane Austen marathon. And I'm still, she's in a different room listening to Jane Austen, and I'm still writing, now I'm writing about the, uh, now I'm uh, writing about, uh, there's three threats in the, uh, in the, in the series, uh, about uh, Princess Kierne and uh, the Countess Daymark, right? I'm writing and running around, and son of a bitch, I'm writing to Jane Austen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of works. I write, 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 I get up, I go over, I say, stop watching Jane Austen. <laughs> it's well. it coming through my work. Just stop uh, watching it. It's like, okay. And so she uh, goes and she starts, uh, and I start in on the third thread, which was uh, Berger and Territory, okay, who were kind of mischievous. And who was it you were watching after that? Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde. This is a book. I'm son of a bitch, I'm writing Oscar Wilde. <laughs> but. It kind of works for that, okay, <laughs> you know, and, that, and that, that's how the uh, the voice ended up uh, through the whole thing. Now, mind you, there's a uh, undercurrent, uh, the, what the story is actually about, which is the undercurrent, uh, undercurrent, the depth of the story, which is inexorably mine. But I mean, that's what happens. Honestly, write what you're going to write, okay? There, there are certain things. Uh, you, if you read this and you read 5.30 Return, you'll see it a completely different voice. More flowery uh, words, uh, wordplay, uh, alliteration. This is short sentences, punch you in the gut. Okay, it's noir, science fiction, in your face. Vaguely horrorish. So, in case you want to buy it. <laughs> you got me with Oscar Wilde. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, are we talking like Oscar Wilde sci-fi horror? <laughs> no, actually, this is uh, Mickey Spillane. This is my homage to uh, I, the Jury by Mickey Spillane. Oh, sweet. With Oscar Wilde? No, not with oh, Oscar Wilde. Okay. There's no <laughs> Oscar Wilde in this. <laughs> Oscar <laughs> Wilde in this. <laughs> We're still waiting for him to write the last thing he said that was a bad idea, which was the bodice rippers with velociraptors. We're still waiting for that for like three years. Uh, yeah. I said I'd write Yeah, that. No, you said you should never write what sells, because if you did, you'd be writing bodice rippers with velociraptors, and all of us are like, we read those. Where are they? No, that a lot of booze in that hotel. <laughs> so, uh, William, what you what you were saying that like having the thing play in the other room like affects your writing and it can like really leak in. Um, I noticed that when early on when I was writing that was more of a problem for me switching between what I was reading and more what what I was writing. 
Uh, I've, I'm actually curious, uh, Sui, if, if you have any insight about this, because you said that like you teach students through the U of A, is and you you've probably like you probably talked to like a lot of younger writers who are just sort of figuring this thing out. Is that a problem that you see more with earlier writers, or is that something that you would say like you see with everybody? Um, well, I think like generally trying to figure out voice can kind of. Uh, because it kind of uh, it's something that you have to work through. It depends on what you're trying to solidify. If it's a you know your like authorial voice that you expect to come through with every work, or you wanna you're thinking about the voice for each each um, And and what I usually because a lot of people in the beginning are usually very kind of confused which they want to focus on and like put more effort into like you're getting right. Um, but because like the authorial voice is something I kind of like you get to hone over quite a period of time, <clears throat> I usually try to talk to students and try to talk to them, and, uh, try to get them to think about voice as how you sort of speak that specific story on the page, mm -hmm. um, and just like to think about each story as its own contained thing that needs to be narrated somewhat uh, in a very specific way, uh, and and so what I usually find in Beginning for writers who are just starting out is that they're not really they're not really thinking about they're not actually really thinking about voice at all. Mm -hmm. Right, it's not something that's really front and center. Um, it's something that usually comes up maybe in like subsequent revisions and when there are um, issues with various points in the book. Maybe when there are POV changes, then the voice kind of changes and you have to talk through um, then deciding what voice works best for the story, especially because voice is like connected to you know the mood the yeah. ideas that are being passed through the story uh, and so I usually ask them to think really hard about what um, what they want the reader to come out of the story with and sort of let that guide how they're going to tell the story on the page and just focus on that and I think you always have to be authentic like you can't have a good voice in writing if you're not honest and authentic in what you're writing if you're just trying to kind of, I, I know people have done a lot of like ghost writing and early on their careers and things, and they just, they're not nearly as good as later when they just started writing what felt honest to them. Uh, and I would definitely say check out as many different styles and voices of authors that you can. Um, because I spend so much time in just writing with painting, I don't get to read as much anymore, which sucks. Like, look, you become a professional writer, and what happens is you can't read. So then when I'm painting, I do audiobooks, and I'd say number one, and this is partly because of the audiobook, for <laughs> the best voice I've ever seen writing. This is the first time you guys will hear me recommend an epic fantasy novel in 10 years. It's Six of Crows. Get the audiobook. It has seven actors. She rotates points of view every chapter, and they actually specifically use different voices for each character, and she wrote each character with a different voice, and it comes across both with the voice acting and then also with her writing. It's amazing. So yeah, that's it's probably the best book I've read in ten years. So, and I hear Netflix is doing a series. Yeah, that's quite a lot where they go, but yeah, yeah. There's two books in that series, but I guess all of her books are in the same universe. So apparently, I'm reading them all out of order. So yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> what, what was the title? Again? Six of Crows. What, what I think is interesting about what you said about being authentic uh, hit home because I spent a lot of years really wanting to do something important. You know, I'm going to make it important. Faulkner, I'm going to do a Faulkner kind of voice. No, I'm, and I tried all these different things. I came from coal mines of Pennsylvania. I was going to do this whole thing about it. And you know what? The thing that came through, they were all facades. I love all of those writers. You know, I write, I, I read far more uh, diverse things than what I can write. But it all ended up going right back to heart. You know, the thing that I loved when I was seven years old ended up being the thing that hit me when I was in my 40s. And I was like, you know what? This is where... I'm going, it, it sounds true, it sounds real, it sounds unique. I would come up with a bunch of ideas and people would like, like yeah, Ira Levin did that. You know, all, all these different things would come up and go, that sounds very derivative. But then when I started talking about my own idiosyncrasies, uh, that went back to what I love, what my voice really was even that long ago. Denying that voice did me no good. Uh, I ended up going right back, and that's when people started saying, you know, you come from a very unique and fresh place. Which was very strange to me because it wasn't unique or fresh at all to me. It felt like it was a million things that I had said 10,000 times. 
but it was the one thing that was mine, and mine alone. And I think that was very interesting in helping me find whatever my voice was going is going to permeate out to and evolve from. But that was the kernel of me, and I denied it for years. So if you have something, you know, see what that is. Deal with that. That's actually very uh, so because that's the thing that I come across every time uh, I teach. Because one of the things people usually do is they want it to sound like the people they admire, um, rather than. Uh, usually, I try to. In order to subvert that, I try to talk to them and ask them to write what they usually would enjoy, which is kind of what you're saying. It's like the thing you actually would love to read and enjoy, they write that. You know, just write the thing that it is. Um, but I guess maybe in that at that time, most people are like really still not. They don't kind of trust themselves, right? Um, so there's no like that confidence in themselves or the stories they have to tell that are kind of unique. It's kind of lacking. And so what usually happens is. Uh, they they rather sort of reach for something that's more established, right? So they rather choose to sort of be close to someone they admire or someone that's already out there. Uh, and but one one thing I usually say is it, it it took that person probably a really long time to kind of like come come around to whatever voice they're working with. And so even if you were like imitating that, it still also took you quite some time, probably even longer to find to like side up close to that voice than to actually unearth yours. Uh, and so I usually say like it's more a thing of like trusting that the stories you have to tell and the ways you have to tell them are actually unique enough, regardless of how ingrained you think they might be. Yeah. Most of the time, it's always a very fresh perspective. And um, if you have a lot of trouble breaking out and trying other voices, <coughs> uh, I learned an exercise like ten years ago. It's really weird, but get any scene prompt you can find them online. You get a book. And write the scene over and over again while listening to every different type of music you can think of. Because bizarrely, just like Harry Jane Austen in the background, uh, music, if you if you ever pick up a book by Charles Dolan, it's fascinating. He actually lists all the bands and albums he listens to per book in the intro. I found great music that way because he listens to different music for different genres and different characters and different... He even has like chasing music he listens to when he's writing the action. But if you're having trouble breaking out of what you feel is like kind of a stuck place with your voice, get some sort of prompt for a, a scene or a story and just try really weird music. Like try writing to mariachi music just to like see what happens because yeah. it will get you past like those blocks. It makes a big difference. And visual too. So that's oh like, yeah. Uh, I keep books of scrap uh, for magazines, you know, if I see a picture that just blows my mind, it could be really idiosyncratic, it could be absolutely National Geographic beautiful, but that all goes into like a story book for myself, you know, if I'm trying to get that feel. I have no idea what's going to jumpstart this thing. It's full of Swiss cheese holes and all of this, so uh, music is a great one, uh, and uh, getting some visual images to get myself thinking in a certain way seems to work for me. Yeah, watch football. Stock market. Stock market. I know a lot of authors have like Pinterest boards or something like that. Where they say, they'll say, this is the aesthetic of my book, and then they'll put all the images there that like capture like whatever feeling it is that they're that they're trying to put in there. Yeah. Something that uh. The, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. I was just gonna, that what you're talking about now is just reminding me of <clears throat> Jean All. She's an older writer that first her she wrote Planet of the Cave there. And what she actually did prior to writing that is she took a survival uh, course uh, by man in the Oregon, Eastern Oregon in the desert, and for I think it was two weeks. And that really helped her get into the mood of uh, writing her, starting, starting her book. I think one of the things we're all saying is you can't find your voice inside your own head, which sounds weird to say, yeah. but you have to pull in things from the world and then that connecting with who you are inside is what's going to help you find your voice and it's going to change over time like the storybook i'm working on now i showed part of it to my boyfriend and he's like your grammar is terrible i'm like no i'm trying to sound like just so stories and i know you've never read them but it's supposed to be this and 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 and, and, and repetitive thing because it's a really weird fairy tale and i know it's different but it's a completely different voice for me so i have no idea if anyone's gonna like it but we'll see <laughs> something that i've found is very helpful whenever i i, I <clears throat> Back when I first started writing this, back when Dinosaurs were real, back when a word processor was a big deal if you had one, it was a huge deal, nobody even had computers. Um, the, um, 
I, I'm always writing on uh, IBM Selector, if you know what that is. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> I ran into a writer's block on a book I was writing called The Crux of Time, which burned up in a house fire, and I'm very glad because all the science was wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, <clears throat> uh, I was writing that, and I was running into a writer block. Uh, and so to knock myself out of the writer block, I just I said, okay, I'm just going to shot this real quick. I'm just going to write a play real quick. And I'm just going to pound out the dial. Pound, 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 just dial it. Boom, boom, boom. Ever since then, I write the dialogue first. I don't even put names inside the dialogue. Okay, I just I write out the dialogue. Here's what people are saying. And everything that is happening in this story, you should be able to tell from what they're saying. Now, I'm going to expand on that as briefly as possible because ink is expensive. And as I fill that out, I can say, you know what? This doesn't match what he's saying. That this style doesn't match, and I can adjust my style. I find that after two or three rewrites, my entire book has a style and a feel and a voice, if you will, uh, that is consistent throughout. Um, I don't know whether that will be any help to anyone, but I felt I had to say something. Because That's I said a that cool happened. way to get over a writer's block, though. That's yeah, neat. It, yeah it, it, it works. It's a, to get past writer's block. I found that the worst part, uh, the, the worst cause of writer's block is I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going. My characters have all gone off in different directions. I might have to just wipe everything out, go back to the superstructure of the uh, of, of the uh, outline, but then just go ahead and I start writing the conversation. Hello, how are you? I am fine. You know, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm going to wipe out the first half anyways. <laughs> and then I'll go because I do paintings for my books too. I'll switch between painting and writing if I get stuck. And that it's a weird thing to say if you have something else creative you can do, whether or not it's for your book, if you're somebody who plays music or whatever it is. The strangest thing is I'll have like students who are just stuck with art. They don't find they're getting any better. And I'll tell them, stop doing art for a week, go write something. And then go back to doing art. And they're like, how did I get better? I wasn't doing it. But there's like some weird subconscious thing with creative things feeding off each other and it works. <laughs> I don't know why it works, but it's a good way to change things up. Yeah, because like sometimes like because you're looking for a specific say um, way of like because like when you're when you're telling the story, you're kind of using uh, a sort of voice that is a way of seeing the world kind of if I can think about it that way. So sometimes you, you want to maybe come, you want sort of like your mind to touch something else in the world that exists that's kind of like close to what you're looking for. Um, and at the point, maybe you're at, at the desk, you don't quite know what that is, but then you go, you know, you leave that and put that aside, and you go out into the world and you like touch stuff, right? You create things. And when you come back, you might have sort of found that, even if you don't know, like subconsciously, you will have done that because you have. You know, gone through stuff. You might have listened to music. For me, it's TV shows. Mm -hmm. I just like I, I try to like watch say shows that don't have anything in common. Uh, say I'd, like line up five of them. Uh, some could be like super dark. Like uh, I think right now I'm doing a switch between um, what's the show about prohibition uh, in the 1920s or so. Uh, but I'm watching two. Boardwalk. Yeah, Boardwalk and Fire. So I'm watching like two 1920s shows, but one of them is Downton Abbey, and one of them is <laughs> wow, and they're like completely different. But what they do is, yeah, because like, you know, stylistically or like thematically or whatever, just like the way they feel. But because I'm looking for a certain kind of thing, um, what happens is just being able to contrast those two can, can kind of tell you at least what you know that you're doing now. Uh, and then you know what, you're edging closer to what you want to tell them. Because as I said, in the world, your mind is sort of like touching something that already exists and that sounds like what you're going for. So it doesn't have to be TV. Uh, it can be anything else, right? It can be art, it can be music, or you're already <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, um, so sometimes you, you want to like, it's kind of like a meeting of you know, mind that you talk about. It's like your mind touching something out there and then you land on the way you want to see the story on the page. Uh, and that's how usually um, a good way to bring because it's communication, really. What we're doing is communicating. Uh, I mean, that's what I, I really want to start conversations. 
because I wrote a really long intro. <laughs> and so that's uh, really it. Uh, I, I'm, when I go out in the world, and I, I do agree that if I go to uh, see uh, burlesque, or I decide to go to an art gallery, or I decide to go to a really cool movie, I am having a conversation with other artists that aren't even in the room, or maybe they're up on a stage separate from me, but water reaches its own level at certain points. And so when I'm hearing the, the communication of someone who's really getting their art out, it helps me. You know, I, it's, it's like riffing. You know? It's like uh, if you're somewhere playing music and everybody's like leading off of each other. I think you get that sometimes. Sometimes it goes nowhere. You know? Sometimes it's just like, yeah, the, I saw um, a really good movie. The Artist Way program, which I actually yes. took it when I lived in LA, yeah. they talk about the fact that it's really weird that our society says you should be labeled an extrovert or an introvert. Mm -hmm. Because all really good creators, and I think this totally relates to finding your voice, are both. And you go through phases of being extrovert, where you just need to get all this stuff to find what you want to say kind of in your head. And then you go through the introvert of like, now I need to like shut myself away and process it. And I think if you're not willing to continually do that process and also like grow and change with your voice, you can just get kind of stuck in like, well, now this is what sells. This is my voice. This is what I have to sound like. And that can that can be a bad trap as a creator. Like you can, you don't want to get stuck there. Well, I mean that, that goes back to what you were saying about a conversation, right? You can't you can't have a conversation without the half where you listen. You can't just talk. Then that's not a conversation. That's it's a monologue. It. Yeah. Yeah. What about character voice? What about the story? Yeah. <laughs> how do you how do you give unique voices? I mean, I read Girl on a on a Train, and I couldn't tell one character from the other because the character voices were all the same. I mean, Girl on a Train had multiple first person characters, right? Yeah. So I I can see where that can come from, and then that kind of comes to what you were saying about because uh, first person is very unique in that way where where the narrator voice and the character voice are kind of the same thing at that point. So it's very difficult to, um, so it's almost like if you, especially if you have, say, characters that come from the same socioeconomic background or, you know, within the same space um, in the world, like Girl on the Train, sometimes it can be difficult. But one of the things I usually think about, at least for myself, because my book is first person, although it's one character, um, and that doesn't change, but, one of the things I think about is that the character's um, identity, history, you know, uh, background, it's gonna really influence how they speak on that page. Um, I can say that with myself, I'm, I'm, I speak this way, but not say every uh, Nigerian person to me is gonna speak this way because they're gonna have certain different experiences, you know, and I've just being, I've lived in like the US for two years and moving around, I can all just tell as well, you know, where. I can see the differences, right? Being on the East Coast, on the Pacific Northwest, is very different from being in the Southwest or in the Midwest, and I can get that there are differences. And even within those spaces, there are differences. So I guess it's a matter of asking yourself where the character comes from and how that can, how does that make them, you know, be as a person? How do they speak? How do they act? And that kind of all kind of comes through on a page. And you might need to write some stuff about that character so you know that, that may yeah, never make exactly. it into the end book. Yeah. It's kind of like if you're designing a world for a movie, you might be designing way more than is actually seen on the screen, but you need to know all that stuff for yeah. that to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think... No, I was gonna, just going to say, yeah, sometimes you write like, you know, you have to think through the character by writing them out, but the, none of that is probably going to make it into the book. It's just a very way to to get like acquainted with the character. I think, oh, sorry, uh, another um, another practical exercise that you can do if you're trying to practice like, okay, I want these characters to sound different, is you can you can have your, you can have different characters tell the same story. This is one thing that won't make it into the book, but if you just think, okay, like uh, an event in my family happened, how does my like mother tell this story versus like how does my sister tell the exact same story? Um, and that can be like a useful sort of like exercise for you to for you to hammer that out. Even though your family comes from like a lot of the same place, who they are as people and their different like points of view on life can really inform how they talk or how they look at things. I, I think uh, two things that you brought up made me think of a couple of bits. Uh, you mentioned how everybody sounded the same. That can sometimes really work. Kurt Vonnegut 
about just about every novel we did are miraculous little novels that are completely different in story. But his narrators are pretty much the same. What they do is different. But they have Vonnegutty in voice. And I think that no one really has an issue with that because it's a splendid voice. It's a voice that is unique and it's very much Vonnegut. You know, it's his style of saying. But if you hear something that's just you know, uh, something that is uh, rather banal, or it feels like everybody is exactly the same. Uh, it, I think it has to do with style and skill. But I don't think you be necessarily have to have any backgrounds. Curiosity of an author and writer and creator is really interesting. Some of the best cinematographers that have ever taken shots of movies for the United States that make us realize what Easy Rider was and all that were not from the United States. They mm -hmm. came from a different area but they were fascinated by what they saw. They saw from eyes that my dad wouldn't see Hazel from Pennsylvania from. And by seeing it in those eyes, all of a sudden there's a new voice. And that seems absolutely authentic. You know, do, will I say that all the characters on the waterfront are authentic? I don't know. I don't know those guys, but they sure felt authentic. <laughs> I'm always looking at you now. Uh, oh, didn't somebody else in the audience have yeah, something else? Somebody, I think we have other questions. Somebody. Oh, yes, ma'am. Going, going back to the being told for different characters and having the same voice. Does that is that a, a clue that maybe your characters are a little too dimensional? Well, I, I wouldn't say that's always the case, maybe. Um, maybe that's not always the case. You know, maybe I just want to say that maybe sometimes, um, even you know, approaching characters with similar voices might not always be a problem. Um, a lot of, say, Neil Gaiman characters sound alike, even if they're you know, within the same book, maybe not so much, but a lot of the characters kind of sound alike, which I would say trace back to his own roots as a writer, right? Um, but I guess maybe if maybe if, if their points of view are that you know three dimensional, if I should put it that way, that's even if their points of view are coming from all these different places that feel real, um, like you feel like that point of view makes no sense, even as a reader. If you're thinking, yeah, why would they think that? Then that probably signifies you know that. It's two dimensional. Even if they kind of sound the same, even if they sound different, but their points of view aren't that relatable, then probably that way. Uh, and I think the points of view also always come, even if they say are from the same family, um, if their points of view um, on whatever it is they're dealing with at the time, whatever the conflict or the story or whatever it is, are, are not realistic for you as a reader, you feel like some of them are, you know, their breaches then maybe, maybe that's when you think about them as two-dimensional. Otherwise, I think even if they sound the same, as far as they feel real on the page, I think it's fine. It doesn't always look at what you've done. Sorry. No. <laughs> I mean, I was just going to carry off on that. Talking mm -hmm. about point of view, I've been at conferences where uh, Nancy Cress, I think it was, said she recommended, she said it wasn't until she limited her point of view to four characters that she had commercial success. You mentioned someone with seven different points of view. That's, that's what impressed me. It was a fantasy novel in another world with seven points of view. And all in and the same they, book. they didn't spend like like three chapters explaining the world either. What was so smart about the seven points of view is that you, because they're all from different places, you're learning with the different characters what's going on progressively through the story. It's very fluid. I was really impressed. That would be hard to pull That's off. Real, I, yeah. <laughs> like, what would you guys recommend, or what have you tackled? Like, how many different points of view in each one? I, well, I think for Bardugo, right, for Six yeah. of Crows, um, why that might have been easier is because um, he already kind of had the world set up um, from like prior books, I think. This, that was my first experience reading her. I hadn't read any of the prior books, and I well, still was able point, to though. learn so, yeah, there's still, like, the world with skill, the characters. Yeah. So. Um, that was still kind of skillful, I have to say, seven characters. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> that was like, um, that's um, impressive for yeah. you. Um, and, and the thing is, I, for instance, I what I'm currently working on, which is the um, uh, epic fantasy set in like, the 15th century West Africa empires, is, um, it has like a, there are like three 
points of view that are like the main people, but like there's tons of others that just like show up once or twice. I think usually when, when I think about point of view, I think about the person who has the most stake in the story. Um, and then if I want to switch, then it has to be, you have to think of like rather than story, you have to think scene. Who has the most stake in that scene? And then usually it's best to give that person a point of view because then <coughs> you, you have a good reason as a reader, Pardon. sorry, um, to care about that character at that point. Even if, you know, at that point there's other characters who are usual POV characters but they don't have as much stake in that scene, then you want to think about who has much, uh, that much stake so that that gets the highest you know, reader attention, which is really what you want, because that, that's what keeps readers coming to page. So you would even come in and just drop in a point of view from some, someone who's not a main character for a particular scene? I would do that. I, I did that currently. And I think it's possible, especially if that character has popped up so often and you've done some you know, uh, character building with them, uh, so by the time you get to that point, the reader kind of knows them anyway. Sure, they haven't been in their mind, but they already know who they are. Yeah. And so it's just for the first time that kind of seeing through their eyes. So things wouldn't surprise the reader as much as you think, because they already kind of know their point, points of view and stuff like that. And, and talking about points of view, um, I don't know where I read it years ago, but um, it changed how I see the word information. So when I'm a huge fan of mysteries, I know everyone sees me paint dragons. This was fantasy, but if you look at even like real crime, when police interview a bunch of witnesses to something, they all can tell the truth but tell completely different stories, and that's because your view of what's true is based on the information that you accept is true, uh, which is why the word information is actually in formation. So I think you have to consider for your characters what information are they considering true because that will really give you the voice of that character. It's very easy to forget, hey, this character doesn't know this, so their voice is going to be different because they haven't had that experience. So if you get kind of stuck, you could start to say, well, what, what information are they facing the world with? What's their truth? And that will help you. Something I, uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be a confession if I didn't do some mental masturbation and read from one of my own books. Um, but uh, uh, it, this is germane to, uh, this is germane in, in Broken Land. Um, I had the problem that I had so many characters and I wanted the voices all to be different. <clears throat> okay, beyond the fact that it was Charlotte Bronte and uh, everything else going on. So um, I, uh, one of the things was I decided royalty does not use contractions. The highly edited, uh, educated do not use contractions, and the less educated they are, the less uh, the more contractions they use, the worse their grammar gets. And just by doing that, it allowed me to slip from point to point to point to point to point into different voices. And uh, uh, Rinkin not, uh, Rinkins nodded grim and said, "Yes, Captain. The Countess sent me." He turned to S turned to escort Gibby back toward the rest, uh, the tents. As they walked, a thought occurred to Gibby. He said, Rinkins, and then stepped over Mount Grass. Yes, Captain, please, we are alone. If there is any friendship left in you for me, call me by my name. Rinkins stopped and blinked. You figure we ain't friends? You never forgave me. I wish I knew how to make it right between us. Ain't nothing to make right. You did what you was forced to do, just like I did what I was forced to do but there's things I've done that you didn't order because we stood together. I mean, you can tell the difference between the characters just that, and uh, that, that comes out of writing the dialogue, telling everything through the dialogue and then expounding on what you, everything important through the dialogue and then expounding on it to get color through the, uh, uh, through the, uh, thing. that's all I have to say. Well, one uh, well, other thing you could consider too is beyond dialogue, what gives your character voice in body language, in size and shape. If you look at, I love to say, like the Pixar lamb, it doesn't talk, but it's got a personality. So, <laughs> like, look at. It doesn't talk, but does it have voice? Questions. I think it does. I mean, people identify it as a character. What is the voice of the Pixar lamb? It's happy. It's joyful. Well, is it it's happy? Child well, because I've seen like the Pixar lamb. Language. I've seen. I've seen. I have seen videos where the Pixar lamb. Like smashes something, okay? <laughs> it's hauled off to jail. And is it happy? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it's but, more a uh, more but, monstrous but, lamp. But people from different cultures or different royalty versus not class, social classes are going to have a body language as well that you can consider that'll help you 
see their Are you saying that people voice. of other cultures would empathize with a lamp that kills letters? <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to go into another Brave Little Toaster discussion? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I can't go through Tuscot like, without the Brave Little Toaster coming up. Oh, yeah. And, like, oh, and, like characters that... Well, well not, I, at, not at the moment. Maybe I have a, I have a comment. This, this exchange made me think about the question that you asked earlier. Like, if your characters all sound the same, does that mean they're two-dimensional? I don't think... I mean, I, I agree with Suyi not necessarily because there's far more to a person than just what they say and how they say it. Uh, and even... even <clears throat> Excuse me. Even if people sound the same, there are all these other cues, right. such as body Some language. Some of your voice is your body language when you're writing a character. Yeah, not yeah. In entirely what you're saying. You want to tell yeah. me back there? Had a question. Yeah. yeah uh, so, real quick comment. I for one love the Pixar lamp, and I don't care how much or what it stomps. I think you are pro alphabet murder. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a I have a question regarding, uh, and it was brought up earlier regarding writer's block. Uh, and, and it's with regard to voice. So uh, I've thought about writing a story, but I get so hung up on how the reader is going to interpret it that I automatically kind of get into this writer's block. Uh, whether it's with regard to the actual voice or the character voice, um, I kind of just get caught up in that. You know, well, the reader needs to clearly understand what I'm trying to say here. So how do you avoid that? Do you, you just, have an outline? Yeah. Okay. Do you have an outline? Oh, no, I don't. No. Okay, well, yeah. And also, don't be afraid to write badly. You can write yeah. it really badly yeah. your first write, draft. Write, write Get it out there, and then... Yeah. Okay. As, uh, <laughs> well, who was it? I, I forget who said it. I think it was... Uh, well, I can't even remember who said it. But the first draft of anything is shit. Um, and, uh, and he's right. The first draft of anything is absolute crap. But um, if you have an outline, that the major cause in my experience of writer's block, and I have had debilitating writer's block at that time, is because I don't know where I'm going or I've gone somewhere that I didn't know I was going to go. Okay, if I have an outline, I can say, you know what, okay, I can cut off, boom, this, they didn't go where they were supposed to go, I'm gonna start writing dialogue, and then you just start writing the dialogue, writing the dialogue. You tell the story entirely through the dialogue, and go back, you can wipe out all that dialogue if you want to, you know, it's cheap, you didn't pay for it. <laughs> you know, just, just go ahead and wipe it all out uh, or start it over again or you like where it's going and you play around with that and now you've got two different, three different, four different people talking, having a conversation. You don't even know who the people are who are saying the things because you didn't even put a name by it. You know, it's just words. And uh, if you do that, you can always go back through and fill in the spaces later. With a good editor, which I always suggest, with a good editor, they will help you develop that into something very sound. And in addition, you are nose blind to your own work. Okay? Everybody is nose blind to their own work. By which I mean you may you may think it stinks, but other people who are reading it are going to smell something completely different. Your nose blind to your own work. You can't, you, you, you do not have the, I'm stepping back and I see things as a whole. And you, a good editor will help you out with that. Just say, you know what, you don't need 12 pages of exposition before you begin, which is what my editor told me once. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in fact, here, I have cut out everything you don't need that I want. <laughs> <laughs> um. I feel like if you have writer's block, the number one thing you could do is be here. Talk to writers and get a lot of different yes. techniques because there's so many approaches. One of my favorite <clears throat> writers, Charles Delin, does not use outlines, but he knows two things, the beginning of the story and the end of the story. And he writes to find out what happens between. And I thought that was really cool. So try a bunch of exercises, but when I was teaching art, I found I had a lot of teenagers because they've been bullied in school who were afraid to draw. And I said, what are you afraid of? doing it badly no one will understand what my picture's of i was like if you gotta draw it badly 10 times start right away get those 10 out of the way if you've got to write it badly for the first two drafts get started it's sitting there it's not gonna right. change it. anything you might as well start writing it and then grow and change and go from there don't be afraid of it i i would also like to uh, pass on a piece of rice from the uh, piece of advice from the ya writer sarah beth durst what she says to herself every time she sits down and writes is uh, she says I always lie to myself. I say nobody will ever see this but me. So if the thing, if the thing that is getting you is like, oh God, what are other people going to think of this? Like I'm skipping ahead and I'm so worried about how my audience will receive it. You can always give yourself permission to write something that you will never show anybody else, that you will never. 
self-publish, that you can just write it for yourself. And then maybe once that pressure is off at the end of it, you will look at it and say, actually, this isn't that bad. I think I will show it to other people. I mean, not, not every creator always sells or shows or distributes everything they ever produce. Sometimes we, we make something and we go, well, God, that was a mistake. And then, you know, we put it in the trunk. So <laughs> if professional writers do it, I mean, anybody. And you can put out a ton of books and still be scared to put us on. I mean, I've got 16 books in this series. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm taking short stories that I've worked on over the last 10 years that are totally different than anything my fans have read. And I'm just going to do a quick little paperback digital release over Christmas and we'll see if they, I'm scared. <laughs> like you don't stop being scared. It doesn't go away. You just learn how to deal with it. But everybody has something unique to tell. We all have our own voice. We all have our own gifts to give to the world in writing or art. And uh, one of the reasons I love this show is because it's really inspiring. Everybody here is really encouraging. And we'll tell you like, go start writing. We want to read it. You're welcome. A full hearty serendipity. Stop allowing paralysis by analysis, as it's called. It's basically spending a lot of time wondering how this is going to end up. You know, just do it. And, uh, you know, I uh, my personal thing is uh, I had writer's block when I had a beginning and an end. And I didn't think too much of the middle. And then I started writing the middle, and I started editing ahead of time. Uh, my, my own suggestion is don't edit till the end of the first draft. You'll just spend forever on five paragraphs that will get cut later. I find that so much of my research and stuff that I spent time on never even made it to anything that I actually had as a final piece. But they were all in there, in a way. You know, in a way, it was the vegetables, uh, in the, the vegetables in the stew. But the reality is uh, I spent a lot of time analyzing instead of actually doing the, the action, which is the writing. And that's, it's actually, allegedly, that's the fun part. You know? <laughs> so foolhardy serendipity. Assume everybody's going to love it. Well, one of the things that really helped me get started with writing was uh, the first year I moved here and came to Tescon, Jim Butcher was a guest, but oh. so was his oh. wife. Oh, and if you ever get to see them speak together, it's fascinating. What happened was he got a lot of success with the Dresden Files. He got so much success, she got to leave her day job as a project planner. And she sat around for about two or three weeks, and she got really bored. And she thought, Jim's always talking to me about writing. I'm going to write a book. So I said, you publish it? No, she wrote four really bad books, and then she wrote a good one. And if you listen to them talk about how they write, and this is a couple who live together, they write completely opposite ways. She knows, because she was a project planner, how many words she needs to write a day to meet her goals. Right. Jim just like goes to the basement and writes when he feels like writing, and like a book comes out, and he kills off characters he's already killed off, and his readers tell him you can't do that, and he needs to fix it. Like They're completely opposite, and yet they're a couple, which is really weird. I don't know when they spend time together. That was a baffle because one of them writes during the night, the other writes during the day. Like they are the most opposite couple. But seeing them here like really lit a fire under me because I thought, wow, she just sat down and wrote four really bad books to get them out of the way because she knew eventually if she kept working at it, she'd see him work at it, that she'd write a good one. So don't be afraid to write badly. You know, if you get a day when you're like, I've written really goodly till now, and then wow, I suck today, you still gotta show up and do the work. You can fix it later, you can rewrite it later, you can edit it later, but if you don't do anything, that block just gets bigger. And another shout out on content editing, or copy editing, whichever editing you think is the most important. Because sometimes that analysis, you're the judge, jury, and executioner of the damn story. It's not going anywhere except for in this gray matter. But I love sparring with my editor. I sat there and I thought my editor, you know, I thought my stuff was shit until my editor started to complain. All of a sudden, it was golden. I could find it. <laughs> <laughs> I learned what I loved about my work. And I learned what I needed to change. And, and don't believe anybody says you can edit yourself. I got no. an argument at Bookman's with someone about that. And I was like, you may be the best writer in the world. You will literally read right over your mistakes and typos or things that you've done with your characters. Well, like Jim killing off a character he'd already killed off, like three books. His book series is, I don't know, 20s on my books. He just forgot that he'd killed a character already. <laughs> And his proofreaders were like, you can't kill that guy. He said, I can do whatever I want. They're like, you already killed him. <laughs> I realize we have five minutes left, yeah. by the way. Oh, yes. so we should probably Any more questions? Any closing, uh, closing comments? Um, I should just want to mention there's a panel I'm in on Sunday morning at 11 that's on subconscious writing and building stories in your head that a lot of the questions you've had here might relate to that as well. So I'm excited about that. I've got another panel on and the social commentary, I believe, tomorrow. And I also have, if you're interested in finding out just how crazy I am, I have a, a panel or a presentation that I'm doing uh, called My Horror Manifesto Horror Does Not Deserve Your Shame. That'll be at 8 o'clock tomorrow night at uh, a smaller 
I think it gets you beat for weird presentations because mine's called unicorn flamingos. So, <laughs> <laughs> which you can come see if you want. Um, no. <laughs> Thanks for coming to our panel. I've come to our signings and obviously okay. get, get all of William's books. I would like to close this out with just one thought. That is. Uh, my, my, my favorite saying, and the thing that keeps me going, is that no great leap forward, no amazing work of art, nothing new in all of mankind's history was ever accomplished by someone who was qualified. <laughs> okay, if you don't think you're qualified to do it, do it anyway. And, and no one's ever going to show up at your door and tell you you're ready to write your book or whatever it is. You can't wait for the stamp of approval. Just do it. No, just do it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And if anyone wants business cards and those sorts of things, we've got those up here. Thank you. Are you local? Are you local? Uh, it sounds like Wendy's room. Because there's a lot of people like meet up in Bookman's and stuff like that. You know, there's a lot of people. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening. Hi, guys. If you're a fan of reading like I am and you've been looking to try out audible.com for audiobooks, we have a link for a free 30 day trial. So go ahead and check out audibletrial.com slash creative plan podcast network. That's audible, A U D I B L E T R I A L dot com slash creative plan podcast network. Thanks. Guess we don't what? do moderators. Guess what? I wasn't here last, so I'm not the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how it works? Yeah. So when he walks through the door, he's the moderator. The very first panel I had ever, ever done was in Tuscon when I moved here 10 years ago. And literally, I sat down and I'm like, oh, you're the last one here, the moderator. I'm like, I'm <laughs> You're the last one to sit down with the moderator. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Or we can just self-moderate that works too. I think that's like a self-saucing. Uh, You're asking me to moderate myself. No, the rest of us will moderate you. Everyone else will moderate. Depends on, did you hit the bar yet? Huh? Have you already hit the bar? I have not yet hit the bar. Okay, then you're okay to moderate yourself. <laughs>